We are very lucky to have these three amazing speakers from very different parts of the world, but all of them uh, working in a very similar sector, which is the artisan sector. I'll start with a few very interesting statistics, but I don't know if you know that there are more than 300 million artisans around the world, and it is the largest source of employment in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, just after agriculture. And as it's mostly made by women, it's one of the clearest paths to eradicate extreme poverty across these regions. And this session is very special because we have three amazing people from different countries, but also that are tackling the same problem from three very different angles. One has their own brand, trying to connect with companies and create really beautiful products in Kenya. One is attacking this more from like the ventures perspective and investing in native communities. And the last one is a foundation working in the Amazon and also making beautiful things. So I would like to start by asking you, uh, first of all, a little bit about what you do, but more importantly, why are you doing it? How were you inspired by uh, or to start your ventures? Uh, maybe Caroline, can we start with you? Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Caroline Nganga. I am from Kenya. I'm the founder of a business called Crafts with Meaning. Uh, we are a five-year-old social impact business in Kenya. We just try to harness the artisanal spirit of our people, mostly in rural Kenya, to create bags, home decor, and lifestyle accessories, which we sell in our local market, and we also do a bit of export here to the United States. So um, I came across the opportunity to be of service to the artisans uh, while doing my, uh, just going through my career, you know. And I happened to be working for the government of Kenya in the Ministry of Tourism. And as you may know, um, around the tourism hotspots is one of the places artisans try to sell their products. Most of the times the products are not standardized, they are not done so well, the designs are not modern, probably not so useful. So the way they try to do it is what we call pity selling. So they'll come to you, oh please, could you buy this item from me? Uh, because I can't feed my children, you know, the, and they will relay the, the, the tourists, um, borderline harass them, you know, to get the items off their hands. And uh, observing this everywhere we went in the course of my work, I just thought because the technique is the same that they would use to make better items and then uh, sort of uh, do better value addition and seek the market, I adopted one of the groups um, that I met and that's how it all started. It was initially just something I did on the side as a passion project to support these women. I honestly didn't even really think of it as a way I could make money. Uh, I just thought about them first. And uh, as we will, yeah, as we move along, it just sort of got a life of its own <laughs> eventually, you know? There is one group and there is another one and there is a product and there is demand from the market. And you start to be seen now as a more organized structure around which artisans can work because that's one of the challenges we have. Corporations want to buy from artisans, but where do they find them? Where do they connect with them? Are they formally registered? Companies won't deal with you if you're just an individual. And we've been going through the paces and our company is growing and I look forward to sharing more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. A big applause for her. Now, Kelly, could you tell us the story of Scott and Ventures? How did you start and why did you start? Um, so that's a very good question. I, and I have to move back a little bit. Like I, I have to start at the very beginning um, of my journey. Um, I'm actually an entrepreneur. I founded my own multimedia company and magazine when I was only 20 years old. And this year we celebrate 11 years of existence for that. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I um, am a creative entrepreneur. I come from a very artistic, creative family. Um, I'm Native American. I'm Minikoju Lakota, to be specific. I'm originally from South Dakota. And I grew up around art, but I, I 
just really disagreed with the you know exploitation and the lack of support for our native artists um you know i know artisans are literally living from you know paycheck to paycheck so just growing up and seeing this it, it was tough to see you know um, my mom make these beautiful star quilts and only sell them for eighty dollars sixty dollars just so she can buy food for us so um that really fed into my passion. I started my company and just even um, growing my business, it was a struggle. I had zero resources, zero support and zero funding, but I did it anyway. I bootstrapped and um, invested whatever I made into my business. And um, last year, we were working with um, our entrepreneurs that graduated from an accelerator program that I also host. But in reaching out to the um, potential funders and investors in Denver, I invited them out and it, it was a mess. It was very bad. Um, they sat across the table from our native indigenous creative entrepreneurs and um, there's just a lot of going back and forth, handing off, um, trying to refer them to someone else. There, again, I, I seen this when I was coming up with my own business and it was frustrating. So then I looked at my founding partner, Alice Loy, and I said, hey, let's start a fund. And she was like, okay, so random, what? And um, so that's where the, I, at the purpose of Skoden and why um, we founded Skoden Ventures. So Skoden Ventures is a um, fund where we are uh, $10 million and we are looking to invest in indigenous black, brown, and women entrepreneurs in the creative sectors that precede. So very, very rare. Um, but again, I how can I continue my work in empowering our um, marginalized creative entrepreneurs and artisans? So that's um, about Skoden. Thank you, Kelly. And Leo, can you tell us also how you started and why did you start? Thank you, Antonio. Um, I feel like indigenous people, as indigenous people, you have no other choice that to support your community, protect your territories, uh, go to school, if that for, that will become your platform to support your village and your community. And um, Hakwa Amazon Foundation came out because um, in, the, in the Amazon especially, a lot of like partners and NGOs have this very paternalistic ways of working with the people in the Amazon, a lot of times, indigenous people get like, uh, in reality, indigenous people get less than 7% of the funding uh, uh, to, uh, that is being given towards the indigenous people around the world. So that is, this is, really, is, is, is it was very bad for the people who are working towards uh, you know, climate change issues, indigenous rights issues, and we don't get any of that funding directly. So in, in my life, I've been working with um, human rights, advocacy, and I had been in the world of NGOs uh, to support um, indigenous communities in Latin America. So I, I decided to quit my job in uh, 2016 and basically said like, I feel like we are at a stage in which we can take things into our own hands in terms of financial support, in terms of in the implementation of, uh, of projects, in terms of deciding what to do with our own lives. Um, because most of the, the, the international political agenda or the NGO agenda is not what we want in our communities and it's not what we ambition on doing and it's not our reality. Those agendas are just mainly imposed by the people controlling the money. And therefore, I decided to open up my own nonprofit to work directly in issues tackling our territory and issues that we as community decide what, that we want to work for. So in 2016, I quit my job, I moved back to my village, and, um, and decided to support. Like one of the, the, the very key elements in my village was like the women, every time I, 
I, I had a job where I moved out, uh, I, I, I was traveling for work. They would say, please help me sell this thing. You know, please help me sell this thing. And I was you know, I can't just do this all the time. Like, go to a conference, put it aside a table, and try to help them, or at the end of the day, I will end up buying them myself. So then I have stocks of things, because like, with the, the money that I was making, I was like, just buying hand crafts from my aunts and cousins in my whole village. So at the end of the day, I decided to create a platform in which we can um, include fashion and activism, you know, fashion and human rights. I think that is the, the key element because like uh, what I was, um, when I started like selling and creating the platform, I wanted to include the story of our people, include the story of activism and, and artists and, and the women and why, why are we doing this? Like, like one of the key elements of um, supporting artisans that are mostly women is that once we leave our territory, our territory is left for um, fossil fuel extraction, violence, extractivism. So if we are able to create a way that the women can have a sustainable source of income, I think that is a game changer not only for the community, but for the protection of the territory, for the protection of the water, for the protection of our biodiversity, ecosystems, kids, culture, everything and holds, like, englobes like women uh, having this alternative source of income. So that's how I decided that I want to be working and Hack Amazon Design is one of the, the projects that we have with the foundation. And the, with the foundation, like, we have like a range of projects. We have, we, we have created the Black Indigenous Liberation Movement, we have created the, the fashion line, the artisan line, and now we have a production company to create videos and to tell our own stories. So like it diverts into different things that englobes things that we want to do and that we decide to do as a community that uh, englobes our own reality and the way we want to move forward. Wow. So as you could hear, we have really, really amazing speakers. I think we could be for a full day listening to your stories. Uh, and I think another very interesting part is that all of you understand very well the problems from the root, not, not from another place and came to the region. So that gives you a very unique perspective. I would love to uh, listen to what are the main challenges you have seen in the communities that may not be that obvious for people not being there? And after that, I would love also to talk about all the opportunities that you are envisioning and, and all the things that are going on that you believe can make the industry keep growing, thriving, and creating more impact. So, Leo, maybe you can start with you now. Could you share what are the main obstacles and barriers uh, that you have seen in the community and how have you been able to overcome them? Yeah, I think one of the main um, obstacles is like the, the social capital that we as indigenous people do not have access to, to open doors, to open uh, um, financial advisors, to open to funds, to open to anything that has to be with money. I think that is the biggest challenge. So for me, that had I had to grow into that. I have like, you know, like uh, ten years had to pass before people started opening doors. You know, in my career, in the philanthropy world, in the any kind of work that I did. So once I had that uh, in into philanthropy or the financial space, that was when I decided to open uh, my own doors to, to create. I think that, that that is the biggest the biggest challenge is finance. The the biggest challenge is like access to finance. And um, the other, uh, and one of the opportunities I think is um, there is a market. There is a market for stories. There is a market for our, our story. There is a market for uh, people that want to consume things that do not damage the, the, the planet. Because, um, you know, you have like this old, you know, green, green fashion, green, green things, but if you can, say, okay, you, you can buy this green product, but also if you can support this community in the way that you're supporting other products that are not necessarily indigenous, I think that is, um, that is something that is happening currently. I think that, that is the opportunity that I, I, th I think we're trying to have an in 
in, in, in that stake of the cake because, um, yeah, we, we hadn't had that chance in so many years. It was really, really hard. Like for, for us, we were just, uh, we just presented at Fashion Week, you know, and, and last February. And, uh, and um, it, was, uh, it was really hard to have an invitation to come to Fashion Week, to even attend Fashion Week, and no other than present at Fashion Week. And uh, that was February uh, this year. And then um, in September this year, we organized another fashion show, and Jacob, and one of the indigenous designers of, in the U.S., had, had his own show, and it was amazing. So I think, like, there are doors that are opening, and now do you see, like, indigenous people in like, Team Vogue and Vogue and then other magazines, and I think there is an opening, and there's, like, a different kind of awakening of consumers, of people, and we just need to know how to handle that because we also, we don't want to be used, you know, for promotion. We want to be seen, but we don't want to be used. And, th and that is a fine line that we, ha we have to be very careful with. Amazing, Leo. Thank you so much. Kelly, on your end, could you tell us which obstacles have you seen on your part of the world and how have you been able to overcome them? Um, the first thing that comes to mind is um, because we are here in America, people tend to assume that we have it just as good as other Americans, and we don't. A lot of reservations are compared to third world conditions. There are reservations that don't have clean water, running water, electricity, um, transportation is sometimes shot. Usually it's just the um, gravel road and um, that you need like a truck to drive on because the roads are that bad. Um, the infrastructures, um, uh, what else? Um, lack of service, so like just even Wi-Fi, come on. You know, and a lot of people just don't understand that or haven't, I guess, you know, um, learned that. But so in my work with my um, my company, Native Max Magazine, I have featured Native artists since the 11 years that we've been in business. So I know what it's like, or I, I've seen, you know, the these artisans, these artists struggle. In North Dakota, like the nearest, um, or to even ship out products, say an artist wants to ship out some product out of their office or their home, they have to travel like two hours to the nearest post office. And uh, on a lot of reservations, on almost all reservations too, um, you don't have a home address to get packages and mail shipped. You have to go to the post office and check your P.O. box, or your, your post office box. Um, so that's another challenge in itself as well. You can't just call, you know, uh, UPS and, hey, can you pick up my packages because I have to deliver them to my customers. Again, that's here in America. That's the infrastructure that we are dealing with that we have to just, you know, but we adapt. Native people, indigenous people, we're, we're adaptable, so whatever. But so that's one of the challenges just automatically off the top of my head. Um, and I think the solutions are, um, oh, and, and another cha challenge as well as the exploitation that we touched on. Um, the tourism industry is well known for exploiting native people here in the US. Um, yeah, loads of challenges. Again, I could, we could go on about this all day. I, I have a whole list. And obviously as a native person from here, we're typically excluded from a lot of these conversations, you know, especially around problem solving. It's like, you know, hey, we want to talk about this and this, but we're just gonna leave the other ones out. You know, and it's frustrating because we are indigenous to this land. We, I feel like, and I believe that we should have some of the first say in a lot of these um, problem-solving conversations. But um, yeah, so but with my work with Skoden, hopefully, you know, I can help help start these conversations because it can't be just me either. Or it can't be just Native people either trying to figure out these solutions. So um, yeah, those are some of the obstacles that I see. 
Thank you, Kelly. And you, Caroline? Um, okay, I resonate with uh, most of what you said, just maybe in different form, and it just shows that the bottom line is the same, exploitation and all that. But what comes to mind that I'd like to speak about is um, the statistics that you just mentioned show the potential of this sector to get people out of extreme poverty. But it is not seen as such important work. It is not seen as, um, for instance, I'm educated, I have an MBA, so when I say that I want to quit my job to start working with artisans, everyone thinks I'm crazy. You know, they're like, oh, I mean, you don't have any other work you can do? And it is the general notion that is spread around um, the kind of work we do. Most of the times it's seen as a last result for people who do not have any opportunities. So when people see that you have opportunities but you've taken this work, they are not very sure why you have done that. And uh, I think that limits the number of people that get into this very important work that would cause a ripple effect in the villages and so on. And we start to concentrate on things that don't have immediate impact in the circumstances under which we live in our various places. So I always find that as a, as a big problem. And I mean, how I have dealt with it is just going for it and talking about it, you know, and when people see uh, sometimes they'll ask you also, does your work really pay the bills? You know, For those who know me, they're like, oh, these people shouldn't be asking these questions. It pays the bills and pays for many others, and many more people maybe should come up and do it. Because also if this work is done by people without exposure, then there is an automatic limit to how far they can go with that. I mean, it's not easy to come all 20 hours from Nairobi to attempt to sell things here, to interact with people here. Uh, to try and go into the retail space here. Even locally in Kenya, just getting into the retail space is not just something you wake up and do. There is a bit of, you know, you have to put together a team, and that's not just something that can be done by other people. It has to be done by people who have the experience, who have the education to go with it, who have the exposure, the connections to go with it. So I hope by the work that we are doing that more people will be encouraged and will see it as really a fruitful career that both supports the artisans and their livelihoods and their homes, but also contributes to giving the world better products, uh, more carbon neutral products as compared to all the ones that we are competing with. Yeah. Thank you so much, Caroline. I think there were a few things said that I really, really love. For example, the concept of being seen and not being used is very powerful. And also the fact that the artisan industry could be a big part of the solution to the climate crisis as well. So I would love to ask you two questions. One is, how can we make indigenous people be seen and not used? What are the tools that you envision for this? And two, how can the industry be better at communicating that working with artisans is at the same time a very good way to have more sustainable production. So, Caroline, would you like to start? Um, I think, um, as Leo said, one of the most important ways is to create our own stories, our own narratives, and not wait for people to come, look at the people we are working with, uh, try to create stories that fit into their narrative. I mean, these are people living in their homes, generally successful in their own right, and we should see them as that, and see them as people of dignity, and we must communicate that story our way. It may be slow, how the uptake of that story, but if there is a critical mass of people who consistently share that as a story, and having even this conversation specifically in this conference about artisans is one of the ways I see as important. I mean, we've had um, sessions on all the other uh, hype uh, topics, so to speak, the topics that everyone has in their mouth are everywhere, but just to have one that speaks about this usually ignored sector is important. So I see, um, and probably that's how I, I, I am trying to do it, just tell the stories, uh, profile the artisans we work with as people of dignity, people who have their homes, who live in their homes, who have a talent that the world needs, and not as very needy people who the world must really pity and, and you know help. Just profile the industry as part of all other important value chains. Yeah. Um, okay, 
Can you repeat the question real quick? So, I so how can we ensure that indigenous people are seen and not used? Inclusion, um, being prioritized. Um, there's, again, just so many conversations that indigenous people are left out of, especially when it comes to solving these problems. Um, and what I've noticed um, with, you know, Skoden, um, we have our, we had to develop our own impact model because, you know, there are tens if not hundreds of different impact models out there, especially for um, venture capital, but I didn't see one that fit in, from the indigenous perspective. Instead, it was switched around. It's like, we're doing all the harm, but how can you help us fix the harm we are inflicting on you. I am not about that. I am like, nope, I don't want to be gaslit. So I sat down with um, Dr. Lee Francis. Um, he's Laguna Pueblo. He's one of our um, advisors in the fund. And I asked him to help me develop an impact model, a proprietary impact model. And we'll measure our own impact within our portfolio companies. And also it promotes data sovereignty. We keep the data. We're not gonna, you know, it's not going anywhere. So it's gonna be ours. Um, and we came up with this uh, system to be able to measure the impact. And it's really uh, based on indigenous values. And um, I don't know how many people have approached me and like, hey, you know, native people, indigenous people have kept up the earth for so long and, you know, now we need your knowledge to keep it up more into the future. Like, how can we, how can you help us again? So then it's like, again, like coming back around of like, you know, exploiting like our knowledge to fix the problem you started. And it's, it makes me laugh every time, but um, I, I see that now as um, all of the, I don't know, d different people and whatever um, are looking to indigenous perspectives um, to help solve these problems. Um, but, um, yeah. I would say you made a problem, you fix it. <laughs> 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 like a lot of times, like in terms of climate change, yes, yeah, we are, have been resilient. We are at the forefront of the fight. We're doing, we have community, um, local perspectives and projects. You know, in terms of like tackling climate change, we're doing it. If like, if you don't protect the protectors of the forest, there's no way you can tackle climate change. That is basically it. Because we need, we, we need to defend the defenders. And that, when people talk about climate change, they talk about the forests, the ecosystems, the species, but they don't talk about the people and the communities thriving. Sorry, I'm excited. <laughs> and the communities thriving. We need thriving communities for thriving forests. And that is one of the key elements that we do. And in terms of, uh, of the fashion line, I think like one of the key elements for climate, like uh, we were just talking right before this session, uh, the fashion industry contributes like 10% of the global carbon footprint emissions of, the, of, uh, of all of it. So, um, and we went, and it's one of the most uh, lethal industries for the planet. And how are we gonna change that narrative? How are we gonna change that um, consumerism? Because at the same time, we are selling things, yet we wanna protect the planet. So how that goes with our bottom line. And for me, in order to do, because we were selling jewelry with Haku, Amazon Design, and the way that we think on doing it was like, what is our next step? How can we improve or go into ready to wear? And one of the key elements to go into the next step was we need to be a conscious line. We need to do, uh, we to make things that will not harm the planet. How are we gonna make that? How are we gonna talk about upcycling, uh, resourcing, um, re uh, reducing the impact, and I think that has to be at the bottom, at the bottom line. 
and on the other two key elements, I think when we first started, we started with creating like the like the jewelry line with the community. And I, I, I remember in the second year, um, one of the one person one, one one person wanted to invest and was like, I will buy you out. I'll give you three hundred thousand dollars. I'll buy you out. And we were like, we were just like. They're like, you know, like our second year, like third year, and like, they're, oh, we'll buy you out $300,000, and that's it, we'll put all the money. And I think for us, that is a no-go, because we need to support our value chain. We need to support the artisans, we need to support the women. We cannot leave them stranded. And that was like, we need to understand how to grow, how to move forward, how to escalate, if we want to escalate, but the most important thing is how to protect the people that we work with. Because the people that we work with, they're not just numbers, they're our families, our cousins, our aunts, and the people that we live with. So I think that is like one of the key elements that we have to think in order to move forward with business. Because business and indigenous people, how we are going to intertwine in the elements of moving forward, you know? We have to be business savvy, but at the same time protecting our, our forest, defend the people who are defending the forest, uh, creating alternative sources of income, uh, uh, stop mining companies, that's a lot to do with. And then throw like business, you know, and, and money and interest. And I think like we have to establish those like core boundaries, that core values in our companies so then we can move forward into whatever what industry that we want to do. In terms of like narrative too, like we are like how how can we be seen and not be used? In the fashion industry, that, that's really, really hard because people want to see like in the stories that we people want to say, I remember the first time I was featured in a, in a national magazine in Ecuador they basically wanted to say that, oh, I just came from the jungle straight to the city, and it was just it. You know, that's the perception that they have of an Indian, of an indigenous person. And my mom, my mom was so pissed because she wanted to, to show her coworkers that I was, and it was like, this is not you. I was like, what have you, what have, what have you said? I'm like, <laughs> you know, like we invested in you and like your education, like all of these things. But like the narrative that people want is that you cannot thrive as an indigenous person. This is just like something of luck, you know, that you didn't have all of these steps before you accomplish certain things. So like I think that that is changing, and that is that is upon us as well to uh, keep our boundaries and uh, do not let other people wear feathers. You know, oh, like. I want to shoot for this thing. Can you wear a feather? I was like, I only wear a feather with my people, with my community. I'm not going to do that. So I was like, I, I had to stop shoots because I got into a shoot and they like have like feathers and like people. I'm like, I'm like, oh my god, I'm not going to do this. You know, I'm not going to. Uh, first of all, like my people will like kill me if like I, <laughs> <laughs> if I'm trying to to do this. But that that is also. But and sometimes we 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 we. We go in with them, you know. We go in with the other people, and without knowing, and and and, and that is what I think. Like we have to try back, think about what can cause, you know, what is the damage to our community, what is the, the 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 things that we don't want to portray as indigenous people, and how to be truthful to the way we are, to the way our people are, and not trying to create that narrative that they want to hear. It's more of like how we want to be seen in the way that is more true and natural for ourselves. Amazing. <laughs> Leo, could you repeat the phrase about protecting the people who protect the forest so we can all use it? <laughs> I don't know. I usually say, like, how can we protect the planet if we don't protect the people who are protecting the forest? You know, forest thri thriving, people thriving. So that is like one of the key elements because when we talk about forests and, and ecosystems and climate change, it was like, how, how do you want to protect all of that if you don't protect the people who are protecting the forest? Love it. So my last question before we let the audience also make some questions would be, I think it's very clear that you are amazing in a lot of different fronts. You are smart, you are driven, you can communicate very well. How can we have 10 times more Carolines, Kellys, and Leos in the world. Do you want to start, Kelly? Um, 
uh, where's the clone cloning machine? <laughs> um, again, it's it's um, helping create opportunities and accessibility to these systems. Um, I come from the res where um, I think just um, financially we're considered poor, but we're rich in culture, we're rich in knowledge. Um, so my mom would always tell me we're not poor. They think we're poor, but we're not poor. Um, but I really just looked around me and I, I just knew in my heart we deserved better. We deserve better. You know, we hear the stories of our people and the resiliency is there. And I'm just like, you know what? I refuse to just keep living this way. And, you know, I really want to change. I, I want to see change. I want to have change within my life. And I really have my mom to thank for that. <clears throat> and um, I really had to learn every everything that I know now, it was either through mentors or I had to learn myself. Um, again, being an indigenous person, it, we don't have access to, again, a lot of resources um, that promotes upward mobility. We don't have that. Um, society assumes these different things about us. They have the stereotypes and all of that. Um, so, you know, I even heard um, within my work, you're a fast learner. You learn very quick. You're able to adapt. You're, but again, that was all survival mode. That's survival mode. Because we needed to survive, we will look at something, you know, it'll take us a minute, but we will learn it real quick. And I have my family to thank for that as well, because again, I come from a family of artisans. Um, which, you know, it's um, another thought that I had, too, was um, on my reservation, I think it's um, the poorest county in the country, is um, Zeebok County. And, but yet, we have artisans that create beautiful work like this, like this is dentalium shells. Um, this is a ribbon skirt. This is native designer made, you know, so we are very creative people, right? We have great style, <laughs> and I, I love that about our people. Um, so again, and there's not just me. I'm not, you know, a crazy story that just, you know, um, a once in a, one in a million, like, amazing person or whatever, whatever I hear um, when I share my story. It's like, wow, how did you come out of where you came from, the rubble or whatever, like all of these different things. And I'm like, mm, there's many of us out there. We are very creative. We are very smart. We just need that the access, you know, to the, again, resources, funding, um, capital, um, uh, technical assistance, the market, you know, it's, it's everything. Um, so yeah, um, I wish I could clone myself because there's so much work that needs to be done. And as a native woman, I tend to take it on. Native women tend to take on the community's work and society put us there, unfortunately. But I mean, I'm, again, I, I don't care how, much work it's going to take. You know, I, I have a responsibility to my community, and not only my community, but seven generations from now. You know, so, um, yeah. Thanks, Kelly. Um, two things come to mind uh, when I think about maybe what we need to do. The first one is that uh, we need to work really hard. We have no choice. Uh, this is the path we have taken. We have to align ourselves to the conversations that are happening around the world. We have to bring our work to the front, not just stay in the shadows, not stay in the villages where we are working, come to the stage of worldwide conversations. And that will highlight the work that we are doing. 
Secondly, uh, we need to offer ourselves as mentors that we never had, you know. Uh, now that we know that that's part of the problem, that you had to try and figure it all out on your own, so what would have probably taken you two years, took you four, offer that to other people and show this as valuable work that uh, is part of how we change the world, and then maybe we will attract more people to come and do the work that we are doing. I think one of the key elements that we have to change is to change the, all the systems of oppression, where there be like universities, uh, access to funding, all of this. I think we need to help change that narrative. We need to change all of those systems that have not supported indigenous people thriving or artisan, artisanal people thriving. I think that is one of the key elements. The second thing, that we have to understand is that we are not here forever and that we have to change that, like get the younger generation uh, take the leadership, take the leadership position, like train the people. Like what we're doing in Haku is that we started seven years ago and one of the, one of, like, one of the, the women in, in, in the community now went through college and now she's like, and international spaces, you know, she's taking care of like the that that space, you know. So we we have to let people come in and we start other things, you know, with always supporting that. And I think that one that is one of the key elements. And for for myself, you know, when I was growing up and I started like going to the UN and talking about climate change, there would like I only seen like other indigenous person from the Amazon at the same spaces and like I felt alone. And for me it was I was the most happy when I see now the new generations occupying these different spaces. And I think that is uh, something that we help uh, we need to help thrive for the future. And um, let things go, you know, let things go and start and support with the new and, and that is good and we try back, go to our homes back in the village and stay there and like live happy. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, I think that's how can you do it and support training, support other people. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. Amazing, thanks Leo. How much time do we have? <laughs> So I think we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, anybody wants to ask one, please? Kelly, I want to ask you specifically, you mentioned you have created your own impact metrics. Can you share with us what some of those are? So we just looked at um, what made a group of people, society, a tribe, whatever, um, how did they live successfully a long time ago pre-colonization? And it was community and all of these um, different elements. So what we did was we turned them into pillars of impact. So it's cultural, cultural, human, natural, and social pillars of a successful group of people. And then now we have to throw in financial because no choice. Um, so those are impact pillars, and when we look at a company or a, yeah, when we look at a company, of those impact pillars, we also look at the impact capital of those pillars. What do they contribute to either their themselves, their business, the um, community around them, or the ecosystem that they're in? What do they contribute to each of those layers? So essentially, it's a theory of change cyclical model. And I hated that somebody called it that. But again, that comes from indigenous knowledge. We've always known that. So to describe it and for someone to say, oh, it's like this or that, that's how it works. No, it comes from indigenous knowledge. We believe that everything is a cycle. Um, and a cause and effect. You do something today, what you do today will live into the future. It might not seem like it. And, you know, again, but this is already knowledge that we have, you know, so we just incorporated it into our impact model and we have a metrics and modifiers as well that really help us with the output, um, which is really cool. Again, I'm not an academic or anything. Um, I honestly got to where I am at 
without a degree. My highest education is a high school diploma. So it's, but I was able to communicate this to Dr. Lee and he spit out this like cool thing and I'm like, yes, you got me. You know, because that's really the impact that I want to make with Skoden. Um, it's with our impact model, it's revolutionary. Um, I haven't seen an impact model such as ours. It's indigenous made, um, incorporates indigenous knowledge because again, people are looking to us for solutions. And um, yeah, so that's a little bit about the model, L little, a lot of it. Um, but yeah, I'm really proud of our model. <laughs> Other questions? Um, thank you for everything. I run a LGBTQ global artisan fund and um, throughout the world. And one of the things that we really have a hard time doing is finding folks. Like we spend a lot of time investing in finding our artisans and designers. And I would just love to hear like from your three perspectives, like how do you find the folks in your community? Because oftentimes what we find is that they feel so, so siloed in the various countries that they work in, and then we're having to go find them, and then we don't know how to get our message to them. So I would love like, some perspective on how you're finding the folks you're investing in or, or that you work with. For us, it's been more of um, two ways. So there's a referral model. So people who know what we are doing tell others who need our kind of work, and we get to know about them from, from that perspective. But also we have really been out there uh, communicating on social media and letting everybody know that this is the kind of work we are doing. If you know any great people who can benefit from the support, um, then you should let them know. This is a way to, to let them know that we are here. So I suppose there is really no other way other than making sure that everybody, first of all, knows what you are doing. A lot of times they will find a way of plugging in, sending out the message they are using the network you already have to achieve the referral model and also just communicating in all the platforms. The people who need it will most of the time reach out to us, at times more than we can actually be able to incorporate, but, which is a good thing because it creates a pipeline and every time our capacity increases then we can bring more people on board. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be very honest with you. We're, we don't have that problem with Skoden or my company. Um, we are closely plugged into the community. What we're trying to do, is continue to do, um, and we're finding new ways, but creating transparency with all of the systems that we're in because obviously marginalized communities, right, um, aren't inc included, again, in a lot of conversations. So th there's a lot of mistrust there, disconnection there. So, you know, within our community, there's curiosity, like, hey, and, and then I'll, that's also a reflection of my work because, again, I've been doing this for 11 years. So already people are like, hey, what is this? I read about this. So then when I tell them, I have to also explain that, you know, it's just really funny that a native indigenous person is inside the finance, this venture capital world is completely bizarre. It's so, like, yeah, so I have to explain, you know, um, what we're doing and what we're about. Again, with the transparency part um, is my suggestion as well on top of what you suggested. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, like one of the, the th when we first started, um, uh, we found a fund and we did like a lot of workshops for many communities and then we found out that we didn't have the market. So that was very detrimental to the work that we did and it was like one of the challenges. But the, one of the thing is was that the people were forgetting how to make those hand crafts. So that was beautiful because we were able to train a lot of people and then they were able to sell in their own communities without us necessarily buying from them. And now we have reduced the amount of, uh, of people or communities that we work with. And now, for example, we'd say, oh, we'll do the, the, we'll do the embroidery with you, we'll do the earrings with you, and then that's how we separate. We are currently not expanding uh, because we're trying to focus on the communities that we already work with. 
Um, and that is, um, that is sad because we would love to work with as many communities that we have, but also we ha I think we have um, um, uh, we owe them, you know, we owe our community, I owe my village, I owe like the people that I already worked with that process, you know, of growth. And once we have that established, I think we can go into other communities. Um, yeah. Reciprocity. Reciprocity with our communities, yes. And, and I think that's the, 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 the key element of, of you, like of indigenous people in general, like uh, black, brown communities, that once somebody has done something, you have to give back to your community, you have mm -hmm. to give back to the earth, and um, yeah. that's basically, that's the model. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I think we have one more question. <laughs> Maybe you can ask both and we can try to be very quick. I think the work we are doing fundamentally comes from that place, that the items these communities make, they don't have any value for them. They do it for survival. Mm -hmm. And we know that these are actually items that can be sold in a real marketplace and that people can value. So we start from there. We create for them a marketplace because the reason they, they go out on the roads trying to sell is from a very basic domestic need for money to buy other items. So if our businesses, our social impact businesses, can create a market for them, then I think we will sort of be on the way to solving that problem. The other thing that I see from my own experience is that a community in a certain area will always make the same thing, the same exact thing. Um, so the first one, the second one who comes to talk to you, they are selling exactly the same thing. So can we support them in the design work, in creating, using the same inherent talent? For instance, if it's weaving, you can all make bags, or some of you can make mats, some of you can make wall decoration, some of you can make red ones, others can make pink ones, not just one thing which you're now trying to compete at the bottom of the price range. So I see those as the two ways in which we can support them. Can we put them in decent marketplaces where they are trading from that point? And then can we support them to use the inherent talent that they have to create a variety of products? Of course, amongst other ways, but I see those are the two that come to mind right now.